based in Paris. The Institute of Democracy and Cooperation is a non-governmental organization uh, whose chairman is Natalia Nelshnitska, the uh, Russian historian and politician. I've listened with great interest to the uh, talks this morning. Uh, I particularly appreciated, Mr. Chairman, your distinction between uh, anti-immigrant nationalist parties and Nazi parties. I was concerned before coming that this distinction would not be made. Um, and uh, I would like to say, uh, with respect to uh, some of the comments made by other speakers uh, in that regard, uh, that we mustn't make an amalgam when we are discussing neo-Nazism. We must not confuse things which should be distinguished. And moreover, we should not uh, attribute uh, the rise of certain radical movements uh, only to things like uh, immigration, although of course that is one cause of them. In particular, I would like to offer you my personal view that one reason for radical, political radicalization is a sense of political alienation, fostered and encouraged by supranational organizations. Supranational organizations like the European Union and the Council of Europe, which unfortunately, because of their excessive zeal in interfering in the internal affairs of other states, very often promote a sense of alienation uh, and of uh, a loss of control, a loss of ownership uh, of the political process. And in that respect, I would like to make a remark which I hope will surprise you. You, Mr. Chairman, you drew attention to these two political parties in Hungary and Greece, uh, which you say, no doubt rightly, uh, are Nazi organizations. I would like to draw your attention to two European organizations which have themselves promoted what I call a revisionist and therefore to some extent neo-Nazi agenda. I'm referring to the European Parliament and to the Council of Europe. You may be surprised if I tell you that the European Parliament and the Council of Europe have in some way been involved in Nazi revisionism. Yet I'm convinced that it's the case and moreover, I am convinced that the kind of postmodern, post-national ideology of human rights, of indiscriminate tolerance, of inclusiveness, and of all the other ideological baggage uh, which we know so well in the Council of Europe, it's my own view that these, uh, this ideology, this postmodern human rights ideology, uh, can itself, paradoxically, play into the hands uh, of uh, those who wish to relativize or even excuse the Nazi experience. I'm talking specifically about the Nazi experience, that is to say about the events of 1933 and 1945. Why do I say the European Parliament and the Council of Europe are guilty of this? Very simply, uh, in 2009, the European Parliament proclaimed the 23rd of August to be a Europe-wide day for the remembrance of totalitarianism. You may think this is unobjectionable, but the choice of the date, the 23rd of August, as I'm sure you will all understand, relates specifically to the events which immediately preceded what we in Britain call the outbreak of the Second World War. We, of course, regard that war as having started on the 1st of September 1939 and not on the 21st of June 1941. The European Parliament chose the 23rd of August because, of course, it was the date of the signature of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And there is a widely held view which has gained ground dramatically in the last 20 years that somehow the Soviet Union uh, in 1939 was an ideological ally of Nazi Germany. This theory, 20 years ago, was regarded as outrageously revisionist. I was myself a student uh, at Oxford in 1988 when the revisionist historian Ernst Molter 
was invited to speak at a historical seminar. And his theories, uh, which in a different way relativized the uniqueness of the Nazi experience, were considered so shocking that uh, he was disinvited. He was disinvited and told not to come to Oxford. Yet 20 years later, this idea that the two regimes, the Nazi regime and the Soviet regime, were effectively the same has been enshrined in this resolution of the European Parliament that I am referring to. Referring to. The key point is that this theory uh, may be true in a very technical sense. It may be technically true that Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were totalitarian states. But that technical truth obscures the radical differences between those two regimes. You might as well say that because an elephant and a whale are both mammals, that there is no difference between them. It is obvious that not only was the Soviet Union, even under Stalin, not exactly the same as Hitler's Germany, but it is also obvious, or at least should be obvious, that in foreign policy above all, the differences could not have been more radical. They picked the 23rd of August for this resolution, largely, of course, thanks to pressure from the Baltic states. Those Baltic states who were the subject of the discussions between Molotov and Ribbentrop, and whose fate was, as it were, sealed uh, in the secret protocols of that pact. Uh, but, and these are, of course, the same Baltic states, particularly Latvia and Estonia, where, as was said this morning, uh, explicitly Nazi revisionist um, uh, monuments are being erected. Uh, but the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was no more the cause of the Second World War or proof of an ideological alliance between Hitler and Stalin than was the Munich Conference of 1938, of September 1938. Indeed, there are far stronger grounds for saying that that conference, the Munich conference, caused the Second World War than for blaming Stalin or for raising Stalin or the Soviet Union to the same level of moral horror as Hitler and the Nazis. I said that the European Parliament was one of two European organisations which has relativised Nazism. The European Parliament is one. The Council of Europe, which as you know is based here in Strasbourg, is another. Along the same lines as uh, that resolution, the Council of Europe's European Court of Human Rights, which sits here in Strasbourg and which has now started to prosecute precisely this postmodern agenda of uh, third, second and third generation human rights that I mentioned, in 2010 upheld the conviction of a former Red Army partisan, Vasily Kononov who had been convicted by the Latvian authorities as a war criminal. Kononov was a Soviet partisan fighting to defend the land of his own birth. He had been born in independent Latvia in 1923. And the Latvian authorities, with the specific and explicit political intention of equating the Nazi regime with that of the Soviet Union, launched a prosecution against him in the year 2000, in uh, the early 2000s, and after many appeals and counter appeals, obtained a conviction, which was overturned on the first hearing in Strasbourg, but unfortunately upheld on appeal. In other words, the European Court of Human Rights upheld the condemnation of a Soviet partisan as a war criminal because Latvia argued, firstly, that the Soviet forces were occupying forces. And secondly, that they were morally equivalent to the Nazi forces which had, of course, invaded the Baltic states like the rest of the Soviet Union in 1941. The case was especially interesting because it highlighted the nature of the war in the Baltic states. Kononov was convicted for executing a group of collaborators, civilian collaborators. These collaborators had betrayed uh, another unit of partisans, who, uh, two months prior to the events for which he was convicted in May 1944, 
and delivered them to the Germans where they were all shot. And Kolonov's mission was to enter the village, discover the collaborators, and liquidate them. And that is what he did. And by upholding their conviction, the European Court of Human Rights, in the name of a amorphous and I would say ultimately dangerous ideology of non-discrimination and abstract human rights, has made of people who were active uh, collaborators with the Nazis, people whose job was precisely to be members of the civilian population in order to betray partisans, he has made of those people uh, victims of a war crime, whereas, of course, they were, in fact, perpetrators of it. So, my conclusion to you is, when we are trying to uh, identify areas in which Nazi uh, thinking or acts are becoming banal and becoming acceptable, please, let's not forget the European institutions themselves. Thank you.